It'll be, uh, I think, an interesting study for some of us because uh, some of what we'll share will probably be new to us about why we do some of the things we do. It'll be something that might be of interest to some of your friends or neighbors if they want to tune in online or join us here because we'll try to talk about some things that will maybe help make the season a little more meaningful. But we're also going to talk about some things out of the Bible that we may or may not know. Christmas is one of those occasions that most people love, uh, but there have been a lot of myths and stories grow up around it, and religious groups have taken a lot of different positions on the holidays. So you get everything from the Catholic tradition that is full bore everything, holiday, lots of religious traditions that have grown up around it, to kind of the other end of the spectrum is uh, uh, groups like Seventh-day Adventists that are convinced it's all pagan and you shouldn't have anything to do with it. And churches of Christ have kind of fallen on the spectrum in there. Some of our churches uh, observe more of the uh, customs around the holidays and some of our churches have not. But depending on what kind of church you've gone to in the past, uh, you've probably been exposed to some different sorts of ideas about the Christmas holidays. You may have heard everything from, the, from uh, it's pagan to it's Catholic <laughs> uh, to it's just purely commercial and meaningless to uh, it's uh, uh, an important way to remember one of the important events in our faith uh, to it's an opportunity to reach out to uh, friends and neighbors and like so many things that we talk about and argue about, there are bits of truth in all of those things. Uh, but sometimes things that uh, people argue passionately about turn out not to be true. Uh, and I'm going to do my best today uh, to try to, today in the next couple of weeks, to try to say some things that may be helpful and interesting, but also set the record straight on a few things. I give you a couple of little teasers. Christmas is actually not pagan. So if you heard some preacher sometime arguing passionately that this is just a pagan holiday, I think I'll be able to shed a little light on, on that uh, in some of what we'll talk about. Uh, but it's also true that the Bible doesn't say anything about celebrating Christmas. But there, there are things in between pagan and not in the Bible. <laughs> you know, not, not everything... Uh, falls into one of those two categories. And so we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, we'll also talk a little bit about the fact that the Christmas story that we always tell and picture in our nativity scenes, like the one on the screen there, also didn't actually happen that way. Uh, we have mashed together Luke and Matthew to create a story that's not actually in either of the Gospels. And... Uh, and we'll talk about that. Like, uh, might be a bit of a surprise to learn that the wise men weren't there Christmas night, despite what's in the little drummer boy video that I love. You know, but, uh, always showed that to the kids. So we'll we'll talk about a few of those things as we go along. Um, one of the connections that Christmas has with the whole world around us is that it's a winter festival. And virtually all cultures have winter festivals. Uh, the winter festivals are connected to two things. One is the calendar. Uh, uh, ever since Roman times, most of the calendars in the Western world mark the new year at January 1st. And that becomes a time when people celebrate, the customs grew up around it. In the Roman world, gift giving was a big part of the new year's holiday. Uh, so much so that in the 4th century, somebody wrote about how people who pinched their pennies all year long suddenly became extravagant at the holidays. Sounds like something that would be written today. <laughs> but it was written about New Year's giving in the Roman world. Uh, and so that uh, the custom of lots of gift giving at Christmas time actually goes back to this New Year's celebration and custom of giving gifts then. But it took on a different kind of meaning among Christians as it was associated with the wise men giving gifts to Jesus, as it was associated with giving to the poor, uh, and so on. So it's not just a simple 
discussion of where the gift giving started, and sort of several factors involved. But so lots of cultures have celebrations around the, around New Year's. But you know, if you're observing the traditional Chinese calendar, the New Year occurs at a different point. If you're observing the traditional Jewish calendar, New Year's occurs at a different point. But in the Western world, we followed this custom of uh, New Year's happening at January 1st in the winter, and so there were uh, New Year's kinds of customs. Uh, in uh, Russia, Russian culture, there was a grandfather frost figure. He was connected to the winter festivals and to, uh, 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 to the whole New Year uh, idea, and he's one of the influences on our Santa Claus. So uh, lots of different winter festivals. But one of the reasons why all across the world there have been winter festivals is because it's the time of what astronomers call the winter solstice. So if you're into astronomy, you know this. If not, you may have only heard solstice when somebody's talking about uh, paganism or something, as though you know that's some, some pagan thing. Solstice doesn't have anything to do with paganism. Uh, the solstice is an astronomical phenomenon. It's just that in various cultures, they point to this, and if you're if you're a part of one of the pagan religions, as we call them, or the non-Christian religions, particularly that involves nature worship, then the the equinox and the solstice and these other events in nature become more uh, more significant. But the significance of the solstice is it's the official beginning of winter. So you know, winter starts about December 21st, officially. Uh, and that, that's the point at which the earth is tilted and on the northern pole is tilted farthest away from the sun. And it's the official beginning of winter because at that point, the light of the sun reflects kind of off, sort of bounces off the northern hemisphere as it's angled away. And so things get colder. But in the southern hemisphere, it's summer because it's tilted closer. Whereas at the summer solstice, it's tilted the other way and you get the beginning of the warm season, the summer season, because you're tilted to the sun, and the sunlight's hitting the earth directly. God made that. Paganism didn't make that. <laughs> you know, that, that, that comes out of uh, the creation of the universe, uh, that we have the sun and, uh, and this movement. And so, uh, so at this point, whether you were a believer in God or not, however you thought the world came to be, even if you don't believe in God, everybody knew this phenomenon. And so what happens at that point is up until then, days are getting shorter and shorter and shorter. And then at the solstice, they start getting longer again because the earth is moving in relation to the sun. Well, now, if you're a farmer, if you're living in agricultural societies, which all the world was until, you know, a couple hundred years ago or less, uh, then that's significant. The, the length of days has to do with the seasons and farming and how much time you have to be you know, outside. And you depend on sunlight for your livelihood and for the growth of your crops. And so super, uh, superstitions and religions that worship the sun and so on had a lot of concern about the fact that it looked like the sun was losing. <laughs> you know, so there's a lot of mythology that grew up around you know, the day's getting shorter, the sun is losing, and then the solstice, the sun starts winning again, <laughs> and the days start getting longer, and even though you've got the cold, dark winter ahead of you, you know the sunlight is increasing, and eventually the spring will come, and so the solstice became a marker of kind of hope in nature, that, that uh, the cycles are going to continue, the sun's going to come back, and uh, everything's going to be fine. So uh, in, uh, most cultures have some sort of winter festival, and they generally involve customs of light. And we'll come back to that, the, some sort of festival of light. There's one of those uh, that uh, is in the Jewish faith. Uh, the Feast of Hanukkah began between the Old Testament and the New Testament, and in John 10, Jesus goes to the temple for the Feast of Hanukkah, uh, or as it's called in the Gospel of John, the Feast of Dedication which is basically what the word Hanukkah means. It was a festival that remembered the rededication of the temple between the Old and New Testament uh, after it had been defiled and desecrated by uh, uh, 
Antiochus Epiphanes, the emperor of Syria who had conquered the area at that time. So it was a religious festival that remembered the rededication of the temple to God. And so, uh, so that festival has a religious and a historical origin, but one of the major features of the festival was lighting of candles every day for eight days. And you see these kinds of uh, images of light, lighting uh, uh, candles, uh, bonfires, wh whatever it might be, associated across many cultures at the winter festival. And so that's true Christmas as well. Uh, we'll talk a little later about where our Christmas trees came from. They came from German Christians, but the way they first decorated them was putting candles on them, which freaks me out that you would put a burning candle on a dead tree. You know, <laughs> I, don't, I wonder how many trees caught fire, you know, that, that way. But, uh, but light is, uh, is, it makes sense, doesn't it, that light would be a part of what people would uh, do that time of year. So that's the kind of the origin of these winter holidays, and Christmas kind of fits into that. It becomes part of, uh, for Christians, it was our winter festival. Uh, uh, why December 25th? So we've all heard, I'm sure, if you've heard anything on this, we don't know when Jesus was born, and that's true. So some people have kind of objected, well, we shouldn't observe the birth of Jesus on December 25th because... Uh, we don't know when he was born. Some people even said we know he wasn't born on December 25th. That's not true. It's not likely he was born on that specific day, but it's possible. I want to tell you what we do know about the birth of Jesus. Uh, the, uh, the early Christians did not mark birthdays. The custom of celebrating birthdays was part of Roman society, but it wasn't part of Jewish society. And so the early church that wasn't their custom to mark birthdays. So nobody really seems to have made a note of when Jesus was born. <laughs> they, they didn't remember that. When you get into the early church, what's interesting is you look at these prominent figures in Christian history, the martyrs who died for their faith. We know the day they died. We don't know the day they were born. So, you know, if you're talking today about a president or a historical figure or somebody you know, we'll list the dates of their life. You know, they were born here, died there. When you, sit, when you look at early Christians, all we know is when they died. We don't know when they were born. Uh, it just wasn't noted. Why would they know death days? Why would death days have been significant to Christians? Any thought about that? What would make a death day significant to Christians? I'm sorry, I couldn't hear you. Can you say that again? <laughs> ah, day of your death is better than the day of your birth. I wonder why. Why is the day of our death better than the day of our birth? Going home. Going home. Christians viewed death as the transition to you know, the next life. It, it, was, it was about our hope. It was about uh, 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 going to be with the Lord. And for martyrs, it was the day of your victory. <laughs> you had been victorious in your faith. You know, it talks about the book of Revelation, you know, these who, uh, who were faithful to death, and now they're reigning with Christ. And so the early church marked death days. So we know when Jesus died. We know he died at Passover uh, in about 30 AD. And so you can go back on the calendar and figure Jesus probably died April 6, 30 AD. Yeah. Uh, little bit of difficulty matching up ancient calendars, but we think it was probably April 6, 30 AD. But nobody seems to have made a note when he was born. Yeah. So we don't know for sure. We do know that he was born in the reign of a king in Judea. The king was Herod. You know, killed the babies. Herod died in 4 BC, March of 4 BC. What does BC mean? before Christ. Jesus was born during the reign of Herod, who dies four years before Christ. There's a problem there, isn't there? The problem is our calendars are off. Our calendar, as we have it today, 
uh, was created in 525 AD by a monk named Dionysius Exiguus who thought Christians shouldn't be counting time from the founding of the pagan city Rome. That's the way time was counted in the Roman Empire, was from the founding of the city of Rome. He said, we ought to count it from, from Jesus, so let's count it from the birth of Jesus. Well, so he had to try to figure out when Jesus was born. So he went through this calculation, tried to figure it out, tried to work his way back through history, and he arrived at the date that we now call, you know, 1 AD for the birth of Jesus. Uh, but we now know he was at least four or five years off. <laughs> uh, you know, so uh, so Jesus wasn't really born four or five years before Christ, but you know, our calendar's off, so it makes it that way. So that helps us narrow down a little bit. We can at least get to the approximate time of his uh, birth. Uh, Luke mentions a governor named Quirinius, who and that there was a a census during his reign, but we haven't been able to identify that from historical records, so that hasn't helped. Uh, Matthew mentions this astronomical phenomenon he calls the star that they see in the east, and it comes and, and, and is over the place where he's born. So you think all the astronomers in Babylonian China that are marking stars and comets and uh, novas and eclipses and all that, somebody would have noted this thing, and nobody talks about it whatever it is. Uh, it's not a, an actual star. You know, when you stop and think about it, you know, the sun is like, what, a million times bigger than the earth. You know, it's just, you know, it's massive. It can't sit over Bethlehem. You know, it's something they're seeing in the sky. We don't know exactly what it was. Uh, and nobody noted it in ancient astronomical records. So there have been various attempts to explain it as the appearance of a comet, something, but... We haven't been able to match it up and figure it out. So it's just one of those question marks. So that would have been real helpful. If somebody had noted that event, <laughs> you know, we could have said, okay, that was the date this happened, but we haven't been able to do that. But there is another clue that's helpful. Uh, Zechariah, John the Baptist's father, was a priest. And in uh, Luke chapter 1, uh, it's his turn to go to the temple to serve. And so uh, uh, in uh, verse, uh, uh, verse 5, it's, uh, it says that he is of the division of Abijah. The priests were divided into divisions. And in verse 8, it says, while he was serving his priest before God, that means in the temple, when his division was on duty, according to the custom of the priesthood, uh, he was chosen by Lot out of his group to go in and offer the incense, and that's when the angel appears that announces he's going to have a son, and of course, nine months later, he has a son. Now, the courses of priests, we know from ancient Jewish records, served twice in the year, every six months. They would rotate, you know, around and serve again. And we know that John the Baptist's uh, 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 father, uh, his course of priests served uh, around October and around April. I, I say around because the the Jewish months are complicated. They're on a lunar calendar instead of a solar calendar, and so it fudges a little bit sometimes. But we'd say approximately around October or around April. That means that John the uh, Baptist is six months older than Jesus, so six months later, Jesus would have been conceived sometime around uh, April, late March, early April. Uh, or he was conceived around October. Uh, then John the Baptist would have been born about three months later, it tells us in the Gospels. Uh, as uh, you remember the stories about Mary visiting Elizabeth and so on. And then Jesus would have been born nine months after his conception. So Jesus was likely born sometime around late December or early January, or sometime around maybe late June, early July. Okay, so now we've got a couple of options in front of us. Was Jesus born in the winter or the summer? So if you want to do Christmas in July, you know, you could, you could argue that. Uh, but here's what's interesting. The earliest traditions we have of Christians dating the birth of Jesus, trying to celebrate the birth of Jesus, are uh, in the eastern part of the Roman Empire, the Greek-speaking part of the empire, at January 6th. Uh, then it begins to be celebrated in the Roman part of the 
the western part at December 25th. Now, this is a little time after Jesus. So we don't think it's based on any notes that Mary or the shepherds kept. <laughs> but uh, it may have been based on a tradition that was passed down that Jesus was born in the winter. Uh, there, there may have been enough recollection of that. At any rate, it's the earliest traditions that we have. Uh, what's interesting is why that time? January 6th, in some parts of the world, was considered the solstice in some calendars. For example, in Egypt, the winter solstice. Uh, December 25th was considered more the solstice in the Roman Empire. Uh, again, you know, you get these problems with ancient calendars. We say we now call it December 21st. But so some think that when they were trying to fix the a time to remember Jesus' birthday. They're remembering everybody else's birthday. Why not Jesus' birthday? They had this tradition, had been passed down that it was at the winter, and so they placed it at the solstice. That's one of the arguments. But the earliest argument that we actually have in writing from an early Christian about when Jesus was born is, was very interesting. It, uh, it suggests that uh, Jesus would have been born on the same date uh, same calendar date, like your birthday would fall on a date every year, would have been born on the same date as the, uh, he would have been conceived on the same date as the date of his death. It's an interesting kind of theological argument that, 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 that they were making, that uh, the, the Savior would have been, uh, would have entered the world at his conception, you know, and then died to usher in salvation, and that they thought it was significant. Those two dates would have been on the same date. Uh, well, if you, if, you, if you do this calculation, if Jesus died at Easter, nine months later would put his birth at late December, early January, depending on you know, where, where Easter fell and where Christmas fell. Those things come together to say, we can't say for sure when Jesus was born. Might have been in the winter, might have been in the summer, but the earliest traditions and attempts to explain the meaning of the time of his birth put it uh, at the winter time. So December 25th is as good as anything. <laughs> you know, if you were a Greek Orthodox Christian, you would have celebrated Christmas on January 6th. If you were a Roman Catholic Christian, you would have celebrated it on December, December 25th. In the end, we don't know for sure. But this is the one we've got. <laughs> it's uh, it's, it's uh, a, as good a day as any. And there's good reason to believe he was born this time of year, if not that's probably not that specific day. Any questions about any of that? Did, I know this kind of complicated, but that make any sense? Yeah. It... I, I said briefly, and it's because it, it's kind of complicated, we just don't know when that census occurred. If we knew, it would help a lot. We know Quirinius became governor in 12 B.C. So Jesus would have been born after 12 B.C. and before 4 B.C. During Quirinius governor while Herod is king. But we don't have a record of a Roman census in that period. Uh, the only record we know of that Quirinius oversaw wasn't until 6 or 7 AD, which is too late to be helpful. So we just don't know. It's just one of those places where we just have to put a question mark. Maybe someday somebody will turn up a document that says this is when that census was, but so far we don't know. Yes? One of the explanations of the star, you know, the word star can be used kind of generally for astronomical phenomenon, is that it might have been referring to a conjunction of the planets, you know, which in, uh, in many cultures have significance. And if you line up Saturn and uh, Jupiter, and there's one other that's sometimes involved in it, but uh, Saturn was sometimes considered the, a sign associated with Palestine, uh, and Jupiter with the ruler of the universe. 
It's possible that these wise men, the magi, the, the wise men, were astro astronomers. We might say astrologers in the court of a Babylonian you know, uh, ruler. They're watching this stuff and they see this sign in the heavens and they go, aha, <laughs> we need to go to Palestine. Why? And so one thought is that it might have been a conjunction like that, something that they saw in the stars, uh, which would be an indication God was aligning something, you know, to, to have them come. That seems to be how Matthew's interpreting this, is that God put this sign in the heavens to draw them, you know, there. But again, unfortunately, nobody at the time identified a specific one at that time that would help explain this. But some have pointed to one conjunction that occurred close to this period and, uh, and might have been the one. Uh, but it's just lots of attempts to explain it. Nobody's really come up with something that everybody goes, yeah, that's, that's the explanation. There's a good phrase, by the way, to learn in lots of biblical study, especially when we get into this kind of thing. It's the phrase, we don't know. We don't know. You know, they're just some things the Bible just doesn't tell us, you know, and we just have to say we don't know. If it was important, I'd like to think God would have left some record for us to know. You know. So the point of the stories in Luke and Matthew is not to answer those questions. We're going to get to what are the points of those stories. You know, uh, won't get that today, but we are going to look at that in the next couple of days. What were these stories about? What, 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 uh, what were they written to tell us? So, um, so, bottom line, don't know what date Jesus was born. Good chance it was in the winter, sometime around 5 or 6 B.C. Uh, that's as, as good as we can get. Uh, some have said, well, it couldn't have been in the winter. I don't know if any of you have heard this argument. Some people you say, well, it couldn't have been in the winter because the shepherds were in, their field, in the fields at night. And nobody's going to be out at night with their sheep in the winter, which is true in the mountains of North Carolina. It is not true in Judea. I have been in Judea and seen sheep out in the winter. Uh, it, it's, a, it's a desert climate, and it just depends. Uh, Jerusalem gets snow once every 10 years. Yeah. It, it's not common. You know, it's a mild, much milder climate. Uh, the climate of uh, Israel and Palestine is more like the climate of Southern California. And, uh, and so that argument doesn't really hold much water. It just, they might or might not have been out that time of year. That doesn't help us very much. Uh, all right, let's do a little, uh, let's do a little trivia quiz here. So we're going to run through, uh, uh, items that we associate with the Christmas scene, the Christmas story in the Gospels. And, uh, of course, the two accounts, we have Jesus' birth are in Matthew and Luke. So, uh, so I'm going to ask, uh, do you think there, each one of these elements is from Matthew or Luke, or is it in both of them or neither of them? So no cheating. Put your Bibles away. So uh, how many of you think the visit of the shepherds was in Luke? How many think it was in Matthew? How many think it was in both? How many think it was in neither? Nobody thinks it was in neither. We know it was in there somewhere. It's in Luke. Only in Luke. There's, there, there's no shepherds in the Matthew story. Only have shepherds in the Luke story. Uh, the death of the infants. Killing of the infants. Luke? Matthew? Both? Some of you aren't playing. Neither. Anybody think neither? No? Okay. Uh, that's only in Matthew. Uh, the birth of John the Baptist. Luke? Matthew? You're just guessing. Doesn't matter if you're wrong. You know. Both? Neither? Anybody? Clue. We already talked about this. I actually turned to it and read out of it. Anybody paying attention to what I read from? It's from Luke. It's in Luke chapter 1 is the story of, uh, of the birth of John the Baptist. Uh, the appearance of an angel, one or more angels. Is there an angel in, only in Luke? Only in Matthew? In both of them? 
Neither. Correct answer is both of them. But it's not the same angel appearance. That's the tricky part. In Luke, an angel appears to uh, Zechariah, appears to Mary, appears to the uh, group of them appear to the shepherds. In Matthew, there's only an angel that appears to Joseph in a dream. So they both have angels, but not. Uh, uh, so reference to the Tamar and Bathsheba scandals. Why in the world would you tell the story of Jesus and refer to two of the biggest scandals in the Bible? So does Luke do that? Matthew? Both? Neither. The answer is only in Luke. It's in the, I mean, no, no, I'm sorry. Only in Matthew. It's in Matthew chapter 1 in the genealogy leading up to the birth of Jesus. We're going to talk about that probably week after next. Is what's going on in Matthew and the way he tells the story. He tells it so differently than Luke. Uh, the Magi, the wise men, Luke, Matthew, both, neither. It's only in Matthew. The wise men appear in the whole Herod story. It leads into the death of the infants that we just talked about. Uh, the virgin birth. Who talks about Jesus being born of a virgin? Luke? Matthew? Both? Neither. Both of them actually refer to the fact that Mary was uh, a virgin. So that's a common part of the story. Being born in Bethlehem? Only in Luke? Both? Well, Matthew? Only Matthew? Neither? Okay, the correct answer there is both of them refer to Bethlehem. That's a uh, it's an interesting piece in the story that they both call attention to the fact that he was born in Bethlehem, which was uh, the city of uh, David. Uh, a manger, Jesus being laid in a manger. Is that only in Luke? Only in Matthew? Both of them? Neither? It's actually uh, only in Luke. And I'll show you a picture of one here in, in just a little bit if I can talk fast. Uh, Description of a stable or a barn with animals. Most of our Christmas images have that image. You know what I'm talking about? You know, Jesus in some sort of a stable or a barn. Is that in Luke? Does that come from Matthew? Both of them? Neither. Neither is correct. We assume there was a barn because there's a manger. A manger is a feed trough. <laughs> But neither of the Gospels actually refer to uh, 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 where the manger is. It doesn't describe it. There are no animals described. I know all the pictures have sheep and cows and donkeys, you know, but there are actually not any animals mentioned in the story. It must have been animals somewhere because there was a feed trough, <laughs> but the story doesn't actually uh, mention them. Uh, the star? The star. Luke? Matthew? Both? Neither. Only in Matthew. Only in Matthew is there a star. So in Luke, the shepherds are called to the main, uh, to the yeah, to the birth to the manger by uh, angels. In Matthew, the wise men are led there by a star. Uh, three kings. Three kings. You know, we three kings of Orient are. Is that from Luke? From Matthew? Both? Neither. Good, neither. Neither. There, there, there are three, there aren't even three wise men. There are wise men with three gifts. <laughs> Gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And then the tradition arose about three uh, gifts, and then they, uh, 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 they become kings by tradition, but they're not in the story. They're not kings, they're magi, they're wise men. I just gave away the gifts. Uh, songs of praise? So where are people singing songs of praise? In Luke? Matthew? Both? Neither. Matthew and Luke have in common that there is rejoicing, but the songs are all in Luke. Uh, so next week I hope to talk a little bit about Luke's musical. But everybody's singing in Luke. Which is, uh, this is an interesting point for those churches that think it's... Uh, it's a pagan thing to celebrate Christmas. Is uh, In Matthew and Luke, everybody celebrates the birth of Jesus except Herod. 
I'm not really sure I want to be in Herod's club on this, you know? <laughs> Everybody else is breaking out and rejoicing. So, something to think about. Uh, Jesus' parents offer a sacrifice in the temple. Is that from Luke? Matthew? Both? Neither. It's only in Luke. It occurs in uh, eight days after Jesus' birth, he's taken to the... No, eight days he's circumcised. At uh, 40 days after his birth, he's taken to the temple for Mary to offer her sacrifice of dedication. And then finally, Rachel weeping. Does Rachel weep in Luke? Matthew? Both? Neither. It's Matthew because she's weeping over the death of the infant. So, uh, so part of that's Now, why did I do all of that? Uh, we missed a bunch of them. Why? Because the way we know the story is through this, what a friend of mine calls this mashed potato approach to the Gospels, where we just kind of mash all the stories together into one story of the life of Jesus. We don't actually know the stories the way they were told. Luke tells the story the way he tells it for a reason, to make certain points, to say certain things about Jesus. Matthew tells the story the way he tells it to make a point, to say certain things about Jesus. But we, we don't read them that way anymore. In fact, most of, most of us don't read the Matthew story at Christmas. You know, uh, uh, on, I don't want to read the Matthew story on Christmas morning. The Matthew story starts in scandal and ends in death. It starts with Bathsheba <laughs> and ends with the death of infants. Matthew's story is a drama. We like the musical. <laughs> so what we do is we pick up the wise men out of Matthew's story and we plop them over into Luke. And now we have the little drummer boy. <laughs> You know, and it's all a beautiful little musical with the wise men and their gifts and the shepherds and all of that. And we've lost these two distinct tellings of the story uh, by doing that. So no, no problem with the fact that we, we don't know if it's Matthew, Luke, or neither. I know we don't. We, part of that's on us who teach the stories. We haven't really taught these stories the way they were written often. So uh, I hope that's a little bit of an encouragement for us to think about these. So, uh, well, so there's, we went through this, there's the kind of the way it all divides out. But uh, the interesting one is that we are so sure there are three kings, we sing about them, and uh, that there's a barn, because the story always happens in a barn, and those are actually not mentioned in the text. So we have this beautiful little image of, uh, of nativity scenes. We collect nativity scenes. We love them in uh, our house. One of our favorites is an olive wood that we've got in Bethlehem. And, uh, and so we love these kinds of things. This is a common one you can pick up in a store somewhere, and you see it has this image of the barn with all the different animals, and here are angels up above it. Sometimes there'll be a star uh, uh, up above it in, in a lot of the, uh, the scenes. Uh, but uh, this is that scene that's the two stories mashed together. That actually didn't happen. We'll talk a little more about this when we get into Luke and Matthew. But uh, the real key is this. Luke tells us that when Jesus' parents went to offer the sacrifice, according to the law, they offered two turtle doves. If you go back to the law, that's true. If you're too poor to afford a sheep, you can, you're supposed to offer a sheep and a dove. But if you're too poor to offer a sheep, then you can offer two doves. When Jesus' parents went to the temple, they were too poor to buy a sheep. If they had, six weeks earlier, been given gold, frankincense, and myrrh, <laughs> they could have bought a sheep. You know. So the wise men hadn't gotten there yet when Jesus' parents went to offer the sacrifice. So we know they weren't there the night of the birth that came later. We'll talk a little more about that when we get over and look at what's in the story. But uh, uh, That's a manger. Uh, to give you an idea of the size, uh, that's a Bible sitting in there uh, that my dad set over in there uh, and, and took this picture. 
Uh, mangers were not the cute little wood things that we have in our nativity sets. Uh, uh, some of you have had an opportunity to visit uh, Israel and Palestine, and you know that Judea is a rocky, <laughs> dusty climate, and wood all, all across most of Israel is uh, precious. Uh, you, you, you know, most of the trees are little things like olive wood trees that are kind of scrawny. Uh, you know, you don't build houses and barns out of wood in that part of the world. Wood's, wood's uh, uh, too scarce. You use wood for other things. You build out of uh, mud and rock and dirt. And so they carved their feed troughs and water troughs out of stone. And so that's what Jesus was laid in. Some hay, you know, put in there and the baby laid in uh, a manger. I know, I just ruined your nativity set, didn't I? It's like, you know, but... Uh, well, it's a lot cuter with the wood. You know, not, ours all have wood nativity scenes, uh, uh, manger scenes in them. Uh, where was he born? Uh, am I supposed to stop at 9.45? So I got about two minutes to do this. So uh, uh, the earliest traditions uh, go back to the time of Constantine's mother in the uh, early 300s, Queen Helena, became a Christian, and she came and brought scholars uh, to study uh, the Holy Land and look for the places where the story of Jesus happened. And they identified a cave in Bethlehem as the uh, site where people had passed down that Jesus was born. How reliable that is, we can't know. But they interviewed and researched and, and identified uh, this, a cave that's underneath this church uh, that she built, although most of what you're seeing there is crusader. That church was uh, destroyed by fire and, uh, uh, and later rebuilt. But if you go down, there's some steps. You can go down into the cave. Of course, it's all ornate now. Uh, it didn't look anything like when Jesus was born. They actually put a little star right here where Jesus was born. I have no idea how they figured that out. I, <laughs> I don't know what it did. Uh, shepherds passed down. Yeah, it was in this cave and right there. You know, that's. Uh, but uh, but at any rate, that's what tradition says uh, anyway. So uh, the earliest traditions we have say a cave. We say, well, wait a minute. What, what about the animals and all that? Well, they didn't build barns. If they if they had access to it, what they typically did was keep their animals in a cave, uh, because that was you know you didn't build a barn out of wood and so on. So that that was common. This would have made sense that uh, that you know there was no room in the inn, so uh, they laid Jesus in a manger. So the, they went and, s and slept in the shelter of this cave where the animals were, and Jesus was laid in the feed trough. That would fit. However, some scholars are pointing out that the word that we have traditionally translated in could mean, uh, and maybe often did mean, something more like a guest room. And the problem may have been that when Mary and Joseph got to this house, maybe it was the house of a relative or something, uh, that the house was already full, the guest room was full, there was nowhere for them to have a bedroom. Uh, but in these houses, often the beds were kind of up in sort of a loft area, and the lower area was where they cooked and the kind of common area, and they would keep some of the household animals there. There might be sheep or something that would be kept on this lower level. And so uh, Jesus might have been in a house uh, and there still have been a feed trough for animals. We might even think of sort of the dog's food dish. <laughs> you know. Uh, and so some say it wasn't in the cave at all. It was in a, in a house somewhere and the guest room was full. Uh, that kind of messes up our whole language about there was no room in the inn, you know, if, if they're right. Uh, but that's not been settled. And I'm not convinced of that argument because, again, the earliest traditions uh, have him in uh, a cave not in a house. But it is interesting that when the wise men get to Jesus, they find him in a house. Uh, now, by then, they could have very well moved into a house where there was room. That's probably the most reasonable is that he was born, even if it was in a cave or whatever, that later he moved into a house. But, uh, but at any rate, if you go to Israel now uh, and go to Bethlehem, you can go to this cave and see the place that at least traditionally he was born. So all of that's to say that our, uh, our tradition probably doesn't look exactly like it happened. The wise men probably weren't there, wasn't a nice wood barn with a little wood manger. But the thrust of it 
is important. We're going to come back at the very end. We're going to talk about this, about what's significant about that scene and the way it blends these two stories and the truths that are rec that are uh, told in that picture. You know, it's not a historical snapshot of what that night looked like, but everything in there has some significance in, in the story of Jesus. And this is a way of combining those stories into one image for us. Way of thinking about it that we'll return to. So what we're going to do uh, next time, uh, I'm going to have to talk a little faster. Uh, we're, uh, next time we're going to talk a little bit about what happened to Christmas between these early Christians remembering the birth of Jesus and the chaos of Mary Hallow Thankmas Eve. Uh, you, you heard it, just this, <laughs> this holiday season that's all been mashed together uh, and, uh, and, and all this time. We're going to talk a little bit about how that happened and then return back to the stories of Luke and Matthew and see what do we, what should we take away from the story of Jesus uh, out of all of this hullabaloo? What's really at the heart of all of this? What do these stories tell us? So we'll talk just a little bit next week about where our Christmas trees came from. They're actually Christian. Uh, may, may be surprising. Uh, whether you have one or not, they, they, that's a little teaser for next week. Uh, and uh, hope to get back to Luke next week if, uh, if, if I can talk a little faster. Hope that was helpful a little bit and uh, understanding some things about Christmas, and we'll see you next time. Well, actually, we'll see you in 10, 15 minutes here.